Right now, it seems appropriate to dive into Eddie's extremely timely new book entitled Begin Again, James Baldwin's America and its Urgent Lessons for Our Own. Officially out tomorrow, but uh, Eddie, talk to us about the book, if you could. Uh, why James Baldwin, uh, the inspiration for it, and uh, why now? Well, thank you, Mika. I've been I've been thinking and reading about James Baldwin for almost 30 years now. And, you know, Baldwin has haunted uh, my thoughts, um, how to think about America. I think he's one of the most insightful critics of American democracy from the vantage point of, of black experience, from the vantage point of the least of these. There's also this this delicate balance in his work between rage and love. There's a kind of righteous indignation that seeps from every sentence. And then there's this kind of this love that emerges in the, in the way in which he's willing to be vulnerable. He has this wonderful formulation that in order to, to say something significant about the country, in order to criticize the country, we have to engage in an assessment, an examination of the messiness of our own interior lives. So that kind of balance between rage and love and his fearlessness. But also, um, I think for this moment, it is his balance between despair and, and, and faith. Baldwin lived to see Dr. King assassinated. He lived to see the country turn its back on the civil rights movement. He understood what Reagan's election meant for all the sacrifices that he engaged in, but yet he still held, held the faith that America could be better, that we could, in fact, uh, be a new Jerusalem. I wanted to figure out mm. how he held those two in balance because my despair at times seems to overwhelm. So that's why I wrote the book. Yeah. And I'll tell you, it, 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 thank you for getting me a copy of it several months ago. Uh, it, it, it's an extraordinarily moving book and a really important uh, book, I think, for most Americans, uh, all Americans to read, especially right now. My goodness, it's become timely. And here's a passage from the book uh, about your visit to the remains of Baldwin's home. The ruins were a fitting description for what Baldwin saw in the latter part of his life in the United States. He saw decay and wreckage alongside greed and selfishness. He saw and felt deeply the effects of America's betrayal of the black freedom struggle of the mid-20th century. The country had refused once again to turn its back on racism and to reach for its better angels, and our children were paying the cost. As I looked out onto the ruins and thought of the election of Donald Trump and the ugliness that consumed my country, I asked myself, what do you do when you have last faith and lost faith in the place that you call home? That wasn't quite the right way to put it. I never really had faith in the United States in the strongest sense of the word. I hope that one day white people here would finally leave behind the belief that they mattered more. But what do you do when this glimmer of hope fades and you're left with the belief that white people will never change, that the country, no matter what we do, will remain basically the same? Amid the rubble of the construction site and the signs promising luxurious living, I thought of Baldwin's witness in his later years as an answer to my questions and part of the reason why I needed to write this book. He grappled with profound disillusionment after the murder of Dr. King and yet held on to his faith in the possibility of a moment when we could all be fully ourselves, what he referred to as a new Jerusalem. I had to understand how he did that and what resources, as he confronted his dark America, he might offer me as I confront the darkness of my own. John Meacham, uh, your thoughts on Eddie uh, and those powerful words. Well, I would, it's an amazing book and important and, and urgent. And what I would ask, uh, my friend, is what are those resources? What have you taken from Baldwin as we address uh, America in a moment of uh, tumult and 127 days or so away from an election, but an election in a system that so many people believe is fundamentally corrupt? Right. 
Well, let me just say this to my friend John Meacham. You saw that reference to Better Angels. That shows you that the soul of America was on my mind as I was writing the book. Um, but I think what I learned, John, a couple of things. Uh, one is that, you know, you have to bear witness. And for what Baldwin meant by bearing witness, we had to tell the truth about the suffering in the country. We had to break through the shibboleths. We had to break through the illusions. We had to, in some ways, insist. We have to insist on a kind of uncomfortable position with regards to our self-understanding so that we can, in some ways, imagine ourselves otherwise. That's the first thing. But then the second thing I realized is kind of moving, moving through over close to 7,000 words. You know, just it's amazing. No, 7,000 articles, pieces of writing, right? Um, is that we have to have faith that wherever human beings are, we have a chance. No matter how dark it is, no matter how bleak it may seem, if we are present in the fullness of who we are, we have a chance. There's no guarantee, but we just have to step up. And for me, that was this, this amazing insight, this abiding faith in the capacity of human beings to be better even though we reveal ourselves over and over again to be disasters. That's what I found. Let's, uh, let's, let's talk, Eddie, about Princeton. Um, and it's very interesting. Um, I, I've supported uh, the Princeton president's uh, position all along. We've talked about it an awful lot. Exactly. Uh, in, 2000, in 2015, I supported it much more strongly than I did after, let's say, Charlottesville. But I, I thought it was interesting. I, I, was, I kept revisiting Wilson and Princeton in my mind over the past month. And then when I saw this op-ed by the president of Princeton, I said, well, my God, uh, that's, that's going around. They, they, so, so all of these, because you and I have talked about this a lot. How do you balance uh, the good that he did the, the progressiveness that he did with the fact that he resegregated um, the federal government. And in 2020, uh, the, 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 and after Charlottesville and after everything else, uh, after George Floyd, that balancing act, uh, it, it becomes far more difficult. And you have to balance on the side, obviously, in this case, of removing Wilson's names uh, from institutions in Princeton. Talk about that process over the past five years. And once again, how 2020 has changed the way we look at everything. Joe, between the Mississippi flag changing and, and Princeton removing Wilson's name, I think hell is freezing over. Uh, but, but, but we're in this <laughs> moment that's, that's really, really fascinating. What I loved about what President Eisgruber said in his op-ed in the Washington Post uh, is that, one, he, re he realized, he, he acknowledged how important Wilson is and has been to Princeton's self-conception, that Princeton as a modern university came into being because of his leadership. But he also recognized that the way in which the university has told the story about Wilson, right, redacted so much of who he was and what he had done, particularly the cruelty and, and, and noxious, insidious views he held around race. And so what he said is that the country has engaged in a longstanding practice of disregard when it comes to the reality of racism and its impact on, on the lives of black folk and in some ways on the soul of the country. And what he then, the move he then made, which is really important, in this moment, we cannot duplicate that disregard. What are the values that animate Princeton? What are we trying to commend to our students? And so Woodrow Wilson still remains an important part of who we are. But it, it is, I think, a moral and ethical decision to change the name. And this is going to be a difficult conversation every time we have it. It doesn't mean that we have to take down the Washington Monument or rid ourselves of Jefferson and the like. But it requires of us to tell the truth, right? about the complexity of these figures so that we can imagine ourselves without the safety of our myths and illusions, as John mentioned earlier. And, and John, it is, it is interesting, the decision that uh, Princeton made mm -hmm. regarding, regarding Wilson, uh, but you have others. And, and Donald Trump is now suggesting, of course, using this as a culture war, that the statues of Washington and 
uh, Jefferson and Madison and others might be torn down. And Jesus, he's the only one left defending it. It is it is important to remember that this republic would not exist but for George Washington, that Martin Luther King used as a, a righteous uh, hammer, uh, the words of Thomas mm -hmm. Jefferson that he drafted in his letter from Birmingham jail used it against segregationists mm -hmm. to positive effect, and that James Madison created a constitution that still, along with Hamilton, that still holds tyrants in check in this country. Um, and so uh, it, it is a balancing act, is it not? And, and we have to be sure that we strike the right balance at all times. Absolutely. And the history, the legislative history, if you will, of each of these monuments and memorials is absolutely essential. Uh, you and Eddie were talking about the Mississippi flag. The fact that it went up in 1894 when the Black Codes were and Jim Crow was coming into being tells you all you need to know. Um, you know, the Lincoln Memorial was seen as a, uh, a kind of a, the Republican monument. FDR uh, pressed for the completion of the Jefferson Memorial in the middle of World War II, in 1943, uh, was the dedication. And it was, in, in FDR's mind at that point, it was, this is what we are fighting for abroad. We are fighting for the ideals of religious liberty, of individual liberty. It's not to say that everything can't, everything uh, should not be considered here. But I think one of the most American places in the world right now is the Tidal Basin. Because you have Martin Luther King, staring in perpetuity at Thomas Jefferson. And whenever I'm there, hmm. I always think that it's King waiting and urging Jefferson to be applied to the, everyone. And so I, I, I tend to be more additive and contextualist, if you will, since we have a a Princeton guy, we can use the word contextualist, uh, <laughs> on these things. Uh, I think that um, let's explore the mechanics of memory. Let's understand as well that sometimes to commemorate is not to celebrate. That's important, it seems to me. And uh, when you drive through Washington, the monuments you see, by and large, are monuments to those who however flawed, however sinful, however limited their views were, they were people who were trying to push us toward that more perfect union. And what I would argue is that the next great phase in American memory and the mechanics of memory should be finding ways to commemorate those who didn't just bend the arc of a moral universe, mm -hmm. but who insisted that it swerve. Yeah, and Eddie, we've been talking for some time about about this issue and uh, writing about it, uh, having a special uh, show to talk about it, and I look forward to doing that. But just your final thoughts on what John said, uh, King looking at Jefferson at the Tidal Basin, uh, King using the words of Jefferson against uh, segregationists uh, in his letter from the Birmingham jail, uh, Madison. Uh, yeah, how 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 do we strike how do we strike these balances and and uphold the ideas of these very flawed men? But understand that we move forward as a country because of many of of these uh, lofty ideas and beliefs. Joe, that's such a wonderful question in so many ways. Um, let me just say this really quickly. It seems to me that we need to tell our story in such a way where it's not about white Americans extending the power of its tradition to black folk, including us. It's not about charity. It's not about a philanthropic enterprise. But to tell the story of the country in such a way that Jefferson and King are inextricably linked, that they're part of the very fabric of the country. Not so much about, right, you know, we were once this and then King forced us to that. No, no, no. But the very way, the, the, the actual content, the, the substance of who we are, bound up in the ugliness of slavery, bound up in the possibility, you know, the, the principles of American democracy, uh, bound up in our Constitution, as flawed it is, as, it, as it is and as it was, right, that this story is, we are constitutive of it. We are a critical part in it. 
And we need to tell that story in such a way that 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 we don't that black folk don't feel uh, as latecomers, if that makes sense, if that makes sense. But the book gets at all of this and we can talk about mm -hmm. it over the course yeah. of, over the course of uh, the day. And we absolutely will. John Meacham and Eddie Glaude, thank you very much. We're going to see you again tomorrow for more on your timely new book, Begin Again, James Baldwin's America and its urgent lessons for our own. Thanks so much. And before we finish today, um, at 1.30 p.m. at Know Your Values Instagram, Yasmin Vesugian is joined by professor, historian Dr. Keisha Blaine for a discussion on black women leaders then and now. Head over to underscore Know Your Value on Instagram at 1.30 p.m. today. And that does it for us this morning. Stephanie Rule picks up the conversation right now. Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube and make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories and you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.